Thank you very much for uh, attending the afternoon session. Uh, in the afternoon session is a session, uh, every time I have an opportunity to go and see judges tell what the do's and don'ts are of their practice, from day one in my practice, I attend those things, have my yellow notepad, and I still have those notepads. Through my career, I continue to go to these things because I'm always looking to strive to improve, make sure I'm not doing the no-nos in the courtroom, and from a practice standpoint, these are one of the most critical seminars you can go to in your profession. You do it throughout your profession. We've been blessed and honored to have three judges here in Orange County, which is dynamite. I'm in San Mateo County, we just can't seem to get an Armenian on a judge anymore after Severian, but we're, we're trying, we're trying. Uh, we have Gossia Karian, and I'm not, and typically we go through the bios of these folks, but I'm, we're gonna try something different and actually have them talk about their careers and go through it. So I'm just gonna mention the names here. We also have Judge Maria, is it Dalian Hernandez? Okay, a little name like Jabal Shrian, I have no business butchering names. And then Andre Mansourian also on the, uh, on the uh, Orange County Superior Court. And with that, I'm gonna open up and just get right into this because we're running behind, but I wanna make sure we get everyone here uh, to get to the point here. Uh, uh, Judge Alperin, can you please uh, walk us kind of through your background, your ascension through, you know, from childhood on, and any of the influences that kind of play to where you're at today? Um, sure. Let's see. Mine, mine is a um, typical story of the refugee, immigrant, Armenian, Jagadakir destiny that has traveled the world not by choice, but due to political circumstances. Um, I was born during the war between Syria and Israel in 1967. We just had its, that 50th anniversary of that, so now you know how old I am. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't ask. But that, that's sort of how it started. My father always made the point I was born under circumstances of war. Um, I grew up in Beirut, Lebanon during the Civil War. Um, I came to the United States at a very young age, but I traveled back and forth every time things would flare up in Lebanon. My parents would send me to the United States because I have two older brothers, they're 15 years older than me, who had come here prior to the war, and so I'd be shipped back and forth. Um, I, I attended nine schools in three different countries by the time I finished high school. So. Um, my background is, 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 you know, complicated at best, but it gave me the opportunity to see the world from a different perspective, which is get to know um, all that is around you that is so different from you. Um, not, you know, that's basically for a child to find a way to fit in, but also, you know, it opens you up to understanding biases, prejudices, different cultures, the way they look at you, the way you look at them. Subsequently, um, I eventually did finish high school in Irvine, California, went to UCI, went to law school. But the turning point in my career was independence of Armenia. I had never lived in Armenia. The first time I went to Armenia was really soon after the earthquake, and I went there with an organization called Land and Culture, and I volunteered there in the earthquake zone, and that sort of was a turning point in my life because I fell in love with the country, and it was still under Soviet rule. So um, I was in law school and Armenia was becoming independent and all I could think of is I want to be there because this time I'm going towards um, the revolution and the fight as opposed to it following me. So I, right after law school I took the bar and um, with the Armenian Assembly I went to Armenia and worked there during amazing years. It's what most people call the dark years for Armenia because it was during the blockade. It was when there was you know, no heat, the country was starving, things were really bad. But um, I lived through those romantic years is the way I phrase it because I was at the right time at the right place working for an organization that at the time in Washington DC was making a huge difference trying to pass and passing successfully legislation to assist Armenia and Karabakh as the war was at its height. So um, that framed my perspective on law, human rights, self of you know, sense of justice, 
if you will. Becoming a judge was never in the books. It was not a plan. It wasn't a goal. Um, I think by being Armenian, no matter where you live, you have the strong sense of what's right and what's wrong. This, this, you're born almost with a sense of justice because of our history that we continue to live with and, and struggle with. Um, so soon after um, a few years in Armenia, working with the US government and the Armenian government extremely closely, um, taking delegations from, from Washington, D.C. to Armenia. Um, in fact, the first, where's Ruben, Mr. The first president, well, the second president of Armenia, Robert Kocharian, the first time he went to Washington, D.C., I was with him in Washington, D.C. And we did this despite State Department blocking Arafah from being in Washington. And though the executive branch did not meet with him officially, um, he went to the Hill and uh, met with members of Congress at that time. So I was a part of a lot of amazing historic moments, I should say. Eventually, I came back to Washington, D.C., went through several years, worked for the Democrats in Washington. Um, the chairman on the board was Al Gore back then. And then I went back to Armenia. I worked for, uh, at the time, candidate Kocharian's presidential campaign. He won. It was an amazing period. That's a whole story of its own. And he offered me a position in his administration. Um, less about a little over a year, as you all recall, there were the assassinations in Parliament. That sort of put the end of my career because I was pregnant with my second child and my family was completely horrified that I was planning on continuing to live in Armenia. And so my husband and I and my little kid, daughter and son moved back to what I knew as Orange County, which is home to me. Um, so I pulled out my bar card, I dusted it off, and became the only kind of lawyer I could have ever imagined being, which was a public defender because it was just sort of natural, right? The defense of those whose rights are stomped upon, kind of defined by being an Armenian. Um, and then started my own law firm, applied to the governor, appointed me, so I'm judge. <laughs> Um, that's sort of a, a compact way of putting it. It's a, it's a very, you know, it's, it's, it was a crazy journey without the goal of becoming a judge, but became a judge. Because I had only done criminal work, I was in a criminal uh, assignment, and then I decided to uh, go into dependency. I feel like that never done, so I am now presiding as a judge in dependency in Orange County. Beautiful. If Judge Monsignor will get to you, and I want you to comment about the uh, public defender defending the rights of those getting trampled on later, but we'll, we'll talk about that one later. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, I figured you did. I saw you write it down mentally with a, with a chisel, by the way. <laughs> Judge Bella and Hernandez, if you could, kind of walk us through your background, sort of, you know, your upbringing or whatnot, kind of how that shaped you to where you're at today. Sure. Um, you know, Judge Montori and I, we, we hate to sit next to Gassia on things like this and talk about this because neither one of us can discuss anything as far as the history that brought us. I think uh, Judge Montori will tell you he's from L.A. and came to Orange County, and I'm from San Diego and came to Orange County. Uh, our paths are very different than our dear friend Gassia, uh, but very, very fortunate. I was raised in San Diego, and... Um, my 87-year-old father, who's trying to take a picture of my phone right there, um, is the reason so much of why I am where I am. Uh, I love being with him. He, he's hard of hearing, so he probably is not hearing what I'm saying. But um, in any event, you know, his parents immigrated from and through Ellis Island, and to listen to those stories, and I and I recall um, when I was able to get the manifest for my grandfather that came over um, for my dad. It's, it's the history. Having not been to Armenia and certainly not have endured and done the things that my dear friend Gossia has done, my world was really um, shaped by the man that my father is um, and the type of 
family that I grew up in, very small town in northern part of San Diego County, uh, raising sheep and steers. So I was a you know a little future farmer and a 4-H'er, and you know the first one that made sure I was going to go to college. And with his support, like I said, beyond words. Um, I was able then to go on to UCI. That was my big move to the city um, here at UC Irvine, where I always thought I would go back to my San Diego roots, um, but became so planted here in Orange County that I stayed up here. Uh, once I was going through my UCI days, I realized I actually got into the law enforcement side. So although you'll hear that I spent 16 years in the public defender's office as a trial lawyer there, where Andre and his people stomped all over the rights of my clients. <laughs> and, and we are actually, we cross paths in the offices, so this is a, this is a fun thing to play around with. Um, but I, like Gassia, I, I couldn't have imagined myself doing any other kind of work. Um, I started with an indigent defense panel, and then I was uh, moved into the public defender's office where I stayed for about 16 years before I was appointed to the bench. Uh, looking at the world through the lens of a diverse culture and knowing the importance of what we do, not only for Armenian people, but just the, the diversity of the folks we serve. Um, it's the epitome of what we're doing now as judges, in my opinion. Um, Having followed behind Justice Cuellar, I'm so moved by so many of the things that he said, the necessity for us as individuals, and especially as lawyers, and I know we'll get into the do's and the don'ts, but the importance of you representing your client, whoever that might be, whether that's the people of the state of California, whether that's a civil client, whether that's a criminal defendant, or where I preside over is I'm the presiding judge for the juvenile court, the children and families. I find those to be the most vulnerable population that we have in this country, let alone this state or this county. Um, and within those factions are all of our people. And we have to do a better job. Justice Cuellar spoke to some of the most turbulent times that we've seen, some of the most, you know, well, I'll just leave it at a very, it's turmoil, politically and otherwise, and the attacks that are coming from the outside in. Um, and what I tell people and what you need to be aware of is we have to take care of our future, which is our children, our families. Because without our families, and that's why I go back to my father, without my family, I am not here today. Um, there's so many other things that go on in our lives and we all have to struggle with prioritization and the, and the juggling. But you serve the public and it's such an important role. And, and don't ever forget that. And I know we'll talk about that in a little bit more as far as the do's and don'ts um, in a courtroom specifically. But just remember the honorable profession that you're in and that you're a part of and what you can accomplish, not only for the Armenian people, but for all of those that are in need. Now, I mentioned that you mentioned you downplayed your travel from San Diego to Orange County, uh, comparing it to Judge uh, Karen being born, you know, during the uh, '67 War. I've been on I-5; it's pretty wild. So <laughs> don't don't downplay that. All right, again, Judge Monsterian, we're going to go through you, but do not forget the aspect of the public defender sitting next to you when you go through that background, please. Yeah, Thanks. Sir, thank you. <laughs> Very hard to follow both of them. They have impressive backgrounds and. I've done great work on the bench, so I'm humbled to be on the same panel as, as they are. Uh, so to tell you my uh, biographical background requires that I tell you that I'm uh, from Glendale. I went to Shanghai Armenian School, and uh, in fact, we immigrated to the South Bay when I was uh, five years old, and the reason my dad eventually moved us from the South Bay Torrance area was because he looked around and didn't see any Armenians and didn't get the sense that we would speak the language when we grew up and know our culture and our history, so he moved us to Glendale. And uh, like I said, I went to Shaolin and then went to high school and, and college and beyond. But I recall from early times in grade school at Shaolin being uh, having passion for the law and not to be cliche, but it really started from television shows and watching uh, some of the old programs at the time. And I looked at trial attorneys and I looked at uh, uh, attorneys that practice inside the courtroom, and I knew from a pretty young age that that was my calling and that was what, where my passion was and that was what I wanted to do eventually. Uh, so uh, it was with that in mind that I went to law school. And now this is where I, I think that to be Armenian and to end up on the bench, I think it's an unlikely path to begin with. I think many of us, especially Judge Aparian, you could easily say have taken the road less traveled. 
Uh, that applies to me. Uh, I think that it's an unlikely path for me to be on the bench now. If you knew my experience in law school, and this is where I maybe might focus on, this room sways younger as I turn to my right, so I'm going to focus on what I think are some of the young attorneys in the courtroom. Uh, this is my way of connecting to, the, to young attorneys. I don't think I see any law students, but uh, I can't stress enough to you how poorly I did in law school and how it didn't click for me and it didn't work for me, and I was this far above academic probation and walked into these classes first year and realized, wait a second, this has nothing to do with uh, working in a courtroom and what I envisioned I would eventually do with my legal career. And so I struggled through it and it was, it was, uh, it was hard to get through those three years. And um, eventually when the time came to look for jobs and I knew I wanted to be a, a DA, but at that point, uh, I know you'll find this hard to believe, but if you are this far above academic probation, employers are not really knocking down your door <laughs> looking for ways to give you uh, a job. So I really had a hard time finding work after law school, and I knew what I wanted to do, uh, that is to say be a prosecutor and uh, uh, hopefully trample on, no, I'm kidding, not trample on I obviously saw it from an entirely different perspective, but uh, I saw it as uh, protecting the community and uh, uh, keeping the streets safe, but uh, that's for another time. Uh, in any case, uh, needless to say, I couldn't immediately get a job at any district attorney's office. I had no ties at all to Orange County, by the way. Uh, I picked up the yellow pages and started making calls around all the counties that I, uh, all the Southern California counties, and the only county that even let me volunteer for them was Orange County. So Orange County District Attorney is where I ended up volunteering for many months. After I passed the bar, which, uh, which is now 20 years ago, after I passed the bar that November after graduation, uh, they were hiring, and of course they had no interest in hiring me at that point, so I got passed over. As you'll hear, that was one of five times that I got passed over, and that's, that's the reality of my story, is I was passed over for, for that office five straight times until they eventually hired me. Who's laughing? Is somebody laughing at me here? Uh, okay, so, so I kept volunteering. Now, I'm not that bright. I kept volunteering with this office that was already not hiring me. So eventually I did the math and realized that this was not a way to get through life. Volunteering my time for nothing was, was not going to pay any bills. So I left uh, my volunteer position. I resigned my volunteer position and uh, started working as a criminal defense attorney on an hourly basis. I just found some, uh, some private practitioners who would be willing to pay me to make appearances and allow me to at least go inside of a courtroom and, and experience that. Uh, because I had spent by then eight or nine or ten months in Orange County, I, I stayed in Orange County and uh, kept commuting down here from Glendale to just uh, make appearances. And along the way, every six or so months, I would apply to the DA's office. And eventually, in the year 2000, I did get hired. And it was great. And I started my legal career as a deputy DA in the year 2000. And uh, I went through the various units in the DA's office, handled cases against both of them, uh, and what's that sort of for? I remember. Okay, so uh, eventually in about 2009 or so, I, I took great pride and was humbled by the fact that the administration of, of my office uh, at that time asked me to run for an opening for judge that they had identified in the county. And the irony of that is not lo was not lost on me at that time, the very office that wouldn't hire me it was now asking me to, to move on from their office, and they thought I would be good enough to, to, uh, to take the bench here in the, in the same county. So I was very proud of that, and I, it was with a, a great amount of honor that I, uh, I ran for election in the year 2010, and uh, was elected at that time, and I had criminal assignments along the way, felony misdemeanor, trial assignments, calendar assignments, um, uh, I'm now the supervising judge of North Court. Uh, I will tell you that on my seven or so years on the bench, my favorite two years were when I was in juvenile dependency, working for uh, Judge Hernandez here was the most interesting, I think, time of my legal career, and uh, she's really hard to work for. Sir, your daughter, uh, she made me call her boss, made me pick up her dry cleaning. I had to do her. <laughs> no, it was great to work for her for those two years, but in any case, that's, uh, that's how I find myself here. It's a prime example of what uh, standardized exams and law school grades don't show is persistence and hustle. So that's always good. I always admire seeing attorneys out there who just don't quit. Uh, so I've been attracted to it. So 
You know, I, you're out here making us laugh, but I gotta tell you that that says a lot about character. Um, I mean, you know, but most people would have went, and like I would, I thought about going back and pumping gas a lot too when I was going through that track, so I get it. So was, thank you for your honesty and candor. All right, now I'm gonna kind of focus on more on the practice points. I've, I learned a lot of my practice the hard way by getting my face bashed in by opposing counsel and judges the hard way. Today, what we're hoping to do is kind of get some lessons out there so you're not learning it the same way I did and I still have scars from it. Judge O'Karen, if you could, it kind of launch us into things that you see that are what you would say are the big do's and big don'ts in your courtroom. Um, okay, so I think this was true when I used to practice and I see how much more true it is now that I sit on the other side of the bench. Um, you have to anticipate what's coming. Okay, knowing your case and feeling like you know your client is not enough. You have to anticipate what the opposition is going to do, what the opposition is going to say, and what the judge is going to ask you. And pay attention to the judge's tone and attitude. You can get a lot out of it. We can't necessarily tell you what we're thinking until the end, but we will guide you because we are asking you, counsel, do you have such and such document? It would be really helpful. Don't ignore those cues, all right? I mean, that's a simple one. The one that is really critical Answer the judge's question. Okay, when the, when the judge asks you something very simple, like how many witnesses do you have? The judge doesn't want to hear your entire case and what you think of the other side and what if they do that and I'm going to do this. If you just answer the judge's question, it would just make the judge realize you're paying attention to the court and you're prepared. Those, I'll, I'll, I'll pass it on. I've, I've been on the bench only two and a half years, so I'll give it to those who've been on the bench. Don't, don't worry, I'm coming back to her, guys. Don't worry. <laughs> um, I would add to that culture. Really important for you to know the culture of the court you're practicing in. Especially, um, you know, when I was in private practice before going to the public defender's office, I would often go from LA County, Riverside, San Bernardino, San Diego. As you all know, each of them have different respective practices and cultures that dictate how their courts run. Um, and if you are crossing over into the crim world, to the juvenile, to family, the civil world, they all have their different cultures. Really important, if you can, figure out what the culture of your court is, meaning know the simple things, like does that judge take the bench right at 8.30 a.m.? Do I need to call the day before and let that clerk know that I will either be there at 830 or that I have multiple other appearances? Um, there are going to be some courts that are going to be more forgiving of that. There's going to be some that have priorities, obviously, when you start thinking about, am I jumping into a criminal courtroom? All of us did criminal work for, I'm older than both of them, so we'll leave it at that, but um, for many years. Criminal approach is much different than when you walk into a family law courtroom, right? Um, and especially in the juvenile courtroom where I've been for the last nine years, culture dictates a lot of how we do business. Yes, we have rules of court, clearly. You have your California rules of court. Be aware of them. Some of your courts adhere to them really closely. Um, so know that culture. If you have friends, colleagues, this is why networking is so significant and important. Call a friend, hey, have you appeared in that court before? Do they have any quirky things? You want to have that respect and that reputation. We all know this, we've talked about it when we teach, we all teach at different levels as well. You talk to whether it's law enforcement officers or lawyers, your reputation is everything. You can crash it in a matter of seconds. It will take you months and years to build it. But I will tell you, you mislead a court, you get caught in something that's quasi or even unethical, folks remember that. And if you don't think judges don't talk behind the scenes of what did you think about that lawyer that just appeared in front of you, you are sadly mistaken. I think we all knew it as lawyers, but I will affirm that for you. Yes, we do. Lunchroom banter about who appeared in front of you. Were they prepared? Do they know their stuff? And were they respectful? That can carry a lot. Even if you might not know the nuances of what's going on, if you're respectful, and that starts from contacting the court clerk, to the court reporter, to the interaction with the deputies, whatever that might be, 
please humble yourselves. Leave your egos outside because those are the things that that staff in that courtroom will talk about for days. Uh, they're both spot on. They both uh, have touched on, I have a list of do's and don'ts and they both pretty much hit all, all of the points that I would have made. Uh, I think Judge Abkari also hit it on the nose when she said, answer the question, that's huge. I can't tell you how often uh, I ask a direct question and do not get a direct answer. That is a problem if you're trying to be an advocate and persuade the court. Uh, Judge Hernandez also hit it, on the hit it on the nose with a number of points she made. Um, what did I write here? Read that. Learn culture of the courtroom. Yes, I really firmly believe that. If you intend to practice in these courtrooms, for a long time, as I hope you do, you need to sort of pick up on little cues inside of the courtroom and it, there's no other way to put it other than learn the culture of the courtroom. Let me give you an example. In my courtroom, you don't have to be in there more than one morning to realize that the real magic is happening when, those, when people ask to approach the bench and have a private conversation up at the bench. I don't do chambers conferences. My chambers conferences take place at the bench. But if you try to uh, handle a case in open court at the podium, that's fine. And it's perfectly acceptable. But I think that if you really want guidance, if you really want the court's assistance in shepherding you to what's best for your client, I would suggest to you that in my courtroom, and I don't think I'm alone, so obviously I wouldn't tell you something that's only unique to me, uh, I think you should ask to approach. If you notice others do that in the courtroom, do it also, and it's a, it's a place where you can be humble, it's a place where your client doesn't have to hear what you don't know, your client will never know what you said, Judge, I have no idea how to do X, Y, or Z. It happens all the time. The, the client will never have to find out. I won't ever have to embarrass you. I don't intend to embarrass you anyway, but you certainly will save yourself a lot of embarrassment if you feel like you're a fish out of water on a particular case, on a certain type of case. Uh, and. That's just one example to me of learning the culture of the courtroom. Uh, I, I think along and respect and being respectful and dignified and professional is an enormous component of, of uh, what my advice to young attorneys would be. Along those lines, uh, small, another small hint, because I like you guys, uh, be cordial to the staff. Be mindful. They are not janitors and lackeys and they are not your peons. You would be surprised how much you can, how much, uh, what's the expression, attracting more what with honey, more bees with honey? Uh, you'd be shocked, is that what it is, Flies? Okay, you'd be shocked what you can accomplish by ingratiating yourself to the staff. Uh, if you don't think the staff tells us what you do when I'm not in the courtroom, think again. If the staff doesn't like you, they won't, and I'm not talking about legal decisions being made based on what the staff says or thinks, that's not what I'm referring to. I'm talking about the little things that can make your life easier, your client's life easier. It's worth it for you to invest in getting to know the staff, being nice to the staff. Just you leaving the staff with an impression that you are likable will take you further than you can imagine. They don't even have to come back and say, oh, he stood here and brought us flowers and talked to us about our weekend. I, that's not what I mean. Being cordial and respectful will, will get you very far. Uh, she hit it right on the nose with reputation. Of course we talk about you. Do you really think we don't talk about you? Of course we talk about you. I have my own S list and I know they have, I know who's on the list. I know who to be careful of when they walk in the courtroom. <laughs> I, it, it's just like we're human beings, just like anybody else. Again, I'm not saying I make decisions against your client because I don't like you. I would never do that. But there's a lot of gray in the law. There's a lot, of, there's some black or white, but there's mostly gray, and in the gray, it helps to have a little edge on your side. Being likable, were you nice to the staff? Uh, were you uh, polite and dignified? Uh, a couple of the quick ones, I, I'm sure he'll ask us more, so I won't exhaust my list, but um, punctuality is a big one. I had one that I wanted to. Ah, uh, I, 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 I have a little trick also that I, I think uh, is worth mentioning. I do a criminal assignment, like I said, I get uh, DUIs, drugs, theft. Many times the attorney comes in and tells me their client's changed, their client's matured now, their client has uh, reformed, their client's sober now, their client made a mistake and is not typically, uh, is typ doesn't typically act the way uh, he acted on that particular night. I see this, I don't see this enough with young attorneys, what I'm about to tell you. I see this enough with seasoned attorneys who are well-established and good at their jobs. So I'm giving you this piece of advice. 
Have, coach up your client to look good in court, to be polite and respectful in court. It matters. If you are gonna take a position and tell me that your client is now sober, he's found the right way, and he'll never do that again, it helps to stick him in a suit and a tie, even if he doesn't own one. It helps to have him stand up straight at the podium and spit the gum out. It's, it, again, we're talking about that gray area. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna screw him just because he wore an affliction t-shirt, but if you're trying to, if you want credibility, if you want me to walk away thinking that you were right when you told me he's sober, what are you guys laughing? Uh, dress him nice, tell him to stand up straight at the podium, and uh, be polite when he addresses the court. I'll leave it at that for now. He's right. <laughs> My dad taught me a long time ago with a name like Joe Alturian, your reputation, like you said, goes down quick. And one word is not Joe Smith, and they're going to confuse you with the other Joe Smith. So, word of advice to all of our young attorneys here your name's going to stick out. Be ready. And uh, the pressure I've always put on myself is I've always wanted to be the best. And I always came in prepared, even on a stupid law motion matter over documents. I knew the holdings of the cases and everything. I just came over prepared because, like, it's better better to come overdressed than underdressed. I mean, it's literally lessons from my parents. I just they literally learned this stuff. But anyways, uh, again, I've I've, I've uh, most of my practice is in the civil realm, so we you know tend, typically get tentative rulings, especially on more complicated matters. And I've done. I, <laughs> Thanks to my uh, half of the Armenian uh, delegation from uh, the Bay Area out of Boston, he got me stuck on a criminal matter once, and I saw that things play a little differently. Uh, I had an issue where the case got dismissed on four felony counts, but had to bring a factual innocence motion. Again, I didn't know how this was going to go. I mean, there was no tentative ruling issue. It was it was none of that. And uh, so I want to know. And then the questioning ended up being about thirty minute argument. So it was new to me because typically civil stuff is you got the tentative and you focus on the issues and you go. Uh, how do you handle in terms of the hearings let's say on a on a particular maybe a motion on me or a, a law motion matter is it inquisitive or do you just allow the attorneys that to handle the argument and just make a ruling how, how do you approach it well, uh, everyone's looking at you uh, <laughs> monster but uh, I'll, I'll, my mother's soul would beat me if i didn't let the ladies talk for her so uh, well, just actually, care. <laughs> actually we'll let um, Judge Bunsen, because he's sitting in the criminal county okay. right now, which is different than Judge Up Carey and I. And so, it, it, again, it. it'll go to culture, but I think he would probably best address that first. Ask me the question here. Yeah, the, the, the focus is in terms of how you handle your hearings okay. that are not trial. Oh, I got you. The regular hearings. Are, so, you, are you peppering them? Are you. Uh, uh, okay, let me, let me start with your point about tentatives and indicators. Uh, my personality is that if I don't know the attorney, I, both attorneys, I don't give indicators or tentatives because I don't want the attorney that I don't know to think that I've already prejudged the case and made up my mind prior to listening to the whole argument. So it, on the other hand, if it's two attorneys that I know, they know that I'm conscientious and fair and I listen to both sides. Uh, I, I feel like I have a little bit more clout with them and a little bit more collateral with them to give them a tentative. Uh, you gotta remember, criminal is a little bit different than civil. I understand that it's civil. It is the norm to give tentatives. Uh, not so much in criminal, I would propose to you. So I generally don't, if I don't know one of the attorneys, I, I let that attorney speak. And even if I'm gonna rule for them, I let them finish their entire argument generally uh, so that they don't think that the court uh, just blew them off and didn't listen to them enough. Uh, in terms of um, inquisitiveness during my <laughs> during the argument and the call, yes, I definitely, you know, uh, I think attorneys make a mistake thinking that just going on and on and repeating themselves and length of argument somehow equals persuasiveness and it just doesn't. I wish I could, I wish I could sometimes just stick the time out sign in the attorney's <laughs> face and say, you're not getting anywhere just repeating the same argument to me. Maybe your client likes to hear that and maybe they're impressed by that, but it's not persuasive. So I think that it requires me at times to uh, inter interject questions during the argument. So if I feel the attorney is going on and on and isn't really hitting the, the right points or ultimately is not answering my questions, even if I never asked it, my, the questions in my head, then I have no choice but to ask questions. There's no, no other way to do that. Um, anyway, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Please, uh, I don't know. And, uh, again, I'll back up. I, I had one matter in the family court, and again, I don't know if it's related to juvenile or not, and it was on a fraud matter that was a sham divorce, and, and you mentioned the issue of culture. And I went in, and I'd never seen such vitriol in the hearings before me, just going at it, no rules. It was the weirdest thing. Uh, and those rules of evidence seemed to go down the 
out the out the window. But in terms of juvenile court, how is the proceedings move forward in, in your courtroom? I, is it more adversarial? Is it more uh, uh, more uh, paternalistic? I, again, I'm speaking out of ignorance. So I don't even know what the right question is. But how is the juvenile courts handled in terms of how matters are resolved? So juvenile is very different, um, very different beast than family, civil, or criminal. Um, by code, by rule of court, and actually by welfare and institution code, we're mandated to be informal and non-adversarial unless there's an issue of factor law that has to be tried. So when you walk into a juvenile court, you see lots of people because there's a philosophy of we are trying to problem solve. It is the ultimate in problem solving courts. That's not to say that we don't litigate. When there are hearings and there are issues that must be litigated, um, we are very tight to rules of court as well as evidence code, which I, I will have to agree with you. I've not done a family law assignment, but there is something that happens very different in a family law assignment in courtroom than it does, I think, in most other courtrooms. Um, and in fact, I've had a few family law practitioners that will come down from family law when the case gets very ugly and they start pointing fingers and we end up removing children. I think all of us can um, attest to this, is that some of the behaviors that I've seen in there, the non-civility, the lack of professionalism, I don't know what happens necessarily in family law courts, but we don't allow that. Um, I, I will tell you the dog and pony show for the client is not something that goes anywhere in a criminal court or in a juvenile court for certain. Um, we are all about the child, best interest of the child and the family, obviously, and reunification when we're talking about dependency. Um, but again, it becomes a culture issue as well. Be aware that you're going to work with stakeholders, um, a lot of different stakeholders in the juvenile court, uh, probation, social services, healthcare agency, department of ed, then all the lawyers for parents, child, county council, public defender, district attorney, depending on what uh, atmosphere you're in or what, what environment you're in. So it's a very cross type of stakeholder diverse group that you need to be able to work with other people and the, the you know the super stand I'm on my own and I'm going to tell you how to do it doesn't work. In terms of uh, how you handle it well, in your courtroom. Just kind of of what I'll tell you this is I mean I did the criminal um, assignment for a year did misdemeanors felonies and then I came over to dependency because I really wanted to do something I'd never done before. It was great learning. It's been great. <laughs> Um, but my motion is the same. You know, it crosses, it, it, no matter what courtroom you're in, here's the way I think my motion goes. This is how I practiced it, and this is how I handle it as a judge. <clears throat> the issues are usually very narrow, okay? It's a legal issue that you're honing in on. And um, as a judge, I have questions. And um, I question the attorneys on both sides equally, and I give them opportunity to respond, okay? So it's a give and take. I think the law and motion section is a give and take between judge, because it ultimately it's the judge you're trying to convince to do something, right? So it is a conversation with the judge. Hopefully you're able to convince the judge or not, but you'll be able to tell from the questions you're getting from the judge. So you need to cue in on what the judge is focusing on. So if the attorney's avoiding the question that the judge is asking, it becomes clear to the judge, that's not a winning argument. Okay, so that's it. As I sit at the kids' table, let me ask you this. Uh, in terms of <laughs> young attorneys, uh, what are some of the typical mistakes that you see young attorneys that are relatively correctable that you just see routinely come out of young attorneys? You don't know everything. Um, you did. You worked really hard, and we all got through law school, and you did a fabulous job of that. Um, humble yourself when you're walking into a courtroom. Uh, be confident in your position and be assertive, of course, with that respect that we're all talking about. Answer those questions. I think Judge Bunsory and Ed up here and both keep hitting it. Answer the judge's question. Don't try to tell them how smart you are because you were magna cum laude in your law class. Um, the reality is, is, and those are very fixable. You just need to listen. What's the call of the question and answer that question, which is why I'm really glad that you know Andre started off with that comment, because it's it's vital to how we move our cases forward. And um, at the end of the day, you are your reputation. Um, and again, as we've talked about, we go back and we talk about 
Was that lawyer attentive to the questions that were being asked? Did they respond appropriately? Um, this is a thing, and sometimes I get in trouble for this. Dress appropriately, please. Um, as Judge Monsoni was talking about your client, absolutely. If you can put that client in a nice suit or you know, a, a dress, if it's a female or something, or a nice pair of slacks, it does make a difference. Of course, it's not going to change our thought on the legality of what decision we're making, but it's an impression. I will say that's for you too. If I see, and I'm going to go, I'm just going to go what it is. If I see another girl come in and flip flops in a courtroom, I'm going to pull my hair out. Um, it's just not appropriate. There is a decorum and dignity of the court. Please, please continue with that. I understand trends. I understand you look cute in the hot little skirt with the flip flops on. You know what? After you get done in the courthouse, then go put those on in the car like I do. I have my flip flops in the car. And I know I, I have to be careful about that because there are all issues with, as we know, whether it's sexual harassment, workplace environment, a hostile work environment. But please carry the decorum that a courtroom and the practice of law dictates, which is put on your suit, put on your big boy and your big girl clothes and go to court. Wear appropriate attire because you know what? People look at that. Those are, those are impressions. And I, I'm sorry to say that. You might be the most brilliant person out there, but if you're coming in and you're looking disheveled and you're in your flip-flops, I'm, I'm thinking that they may be paying closer attention to the person who's saying something else. I know that's shallow, but... I, I, I'm going to add something to this, and, and I'm going to give myself a little bit of freedom with this issue because Absolutely. I'm going to speak as a, as a female, okay? As a woman who has worked in numerous fields and professions, high up, both in government, both in Armenia, in the US, in um, politics, as well as in court, as an attorney and as a judge, okay? Women have worked so hard, harder than men, most of the time, to get where they are, okay? You like it, you don't like it, that's a fact, all right? What I wanna tell you is, if you want to be taken as seriously as your male colleague, right, it has nothing to do with your smarts, it has nothing to do with what you have to say or how you deliver it, make sure that there isn't attention being given to the way you look as a woman, okay? For example, the mini skirt without the stockings that is showing your shape with the stiletto high heels is beautiful, 100%. I want to wear it. Don't wear it in court. Why do you want to wear a red skirt without stockings and a pair of stilettos and expect the judge to take you just as seriously as the man next to you with a dark suit and a dark tie that is basically not defined? Okay. So we talk about sexism being used against us, right? Don't add to it, all right? You have your own style, 100%, show it. Show it in your work, show it the way you speak, show it in the way you represent your client, and show it in the way you dress. I'm not saying put on the dark suit with the tie, okay? If that's your choice, that's fine. But there is a difference, all right? between bringing in your sexuality into court and having everybody pay attention. If you're a trial attorney, if you're a trial attorney, I mean, I've done cases where I'm hoping that the jury's looking at my pair of shoes because that's the best thing I have, right? <laughs> but that's almost, that's almost a joke. I'm also making sure that they are listening to me and not checking out my long earrings and my gigantic makeup and my tight skirt. And I hope this is not offensive to anybody, but it is something that I feel very strong about as a woman. It's the same thing I tell my daughter. It's the same thing I would tell my colleagues. You want to be taken as seriously as your male colleagues? Then make sure that whoever's listening to you is listening to what you're delivering as an attorney. That's what I, I want to hear the male's version of this. <laughs> <laughs> Very well said, actually. I really appreciate that. Very articulate. Thank you for that. Uh, so I'll touch on it a little bit. I'll pivot a little bit. Uh, watch your body language. Don't make faces when I don't rule your way. Be careful when you're demonstrative. I see it. I'm looking right at you. If you make a face, I'm watching it. And it'll drive me crazy. And I remember it. So don't pout. 
and don't make faces, but you'd be surprised. I've had attorneys throw their pen in the air if they don't like the ruling. Not, now, luckily, no one would do that at me, but I've seen it done to a different judge. But you can't go like this if I don't rule your way. I know you're thinking you would never do this, but your colleagues and your coworkers and your friends do that. If you see them, advise them that we notice it and it doesn't reflect well on you. I just want to raise a quick war, war story on this issue for the guys, because again, I have no business talking about fashion or men's clothing, but I tried a case, and uh, I had a juror, and I asked him uh, if he thought the civil justice system was fair. And he put his hand up and he said, no way. And I was trying to case against three big firms, and I was on, on myself on my side, and at the time I was wearing a $100 gotchalk suit. I would never come in looking like I'm a million bucks. I make it look like uh, I come in respectable, but I'm not wearing a watch. I wear a wedding ring because at least one person trusts me. And, and, and I press my clothes, and that's it. And the juror was trying to get off claiming he had brain damage. But brain damage ha had some keen senses, and he said no. And I asked him why. And he goes, because usually the side with more money wins. And the other side was, uh, it was actually a firm out of Orange County, I won't mention names, they probably come in front of you, but uh, right here. And, uh, the guy had uh, cuff links, Rolex watch, $600 haircut, $1,000 suit. And I, I went and asked one further question. I asked, who do you think that is? And he looked past me and he goes, um, I go, do you, know who, uh, who, do you have an opinion of who that is in this case? He goes, I have a pretty good idea. And he was looking right at defense counsel. Uh, so do not convey that you're much, mo most of the jurors don't even have a suit, let alone, you know, so I try cases usually with two suits. I throw on maybe three or four times uh, ties a week. I clean my shoes. I never polish them. I, you know, I, I press my clothes. I iron them. But I never come in looking like I'm worth, you know, a million dollars. So for the ladies, I've seen it with witnesses. I tell them, don't wear jewelry, heavy jewelry. You're, you're not going to be sympathetic if a woman looks like Mr. T. Just don't do it. Uh, you got to, as an attorney, you, that the appearances are they're making the judgments right off the bat. I've seen it. I mean, you read books like Clarence Darrow. He used to hold that cigar with the wire in it and let that ash go, and the jury's watching whether that ash and the brain's not listening to the attorney. Uh, you've got to be cognizant of how you appear, and not in front of the judges, the jury even worse, because the judge is going to come back. Judge, after a while, if you're in the same court, the judge is going to see you and your reputation is going to go. Jurors are only going to see that one time, and that's it. So you just, again, I apologize for cutting in, but I thought that was a very, the, the dress is really critical. Uh, let me jump over to another one. This one I didn't toss out, but. If you could, list kind of like your top five excuses that really just make you, it sounds like a fingernails on a chalkboard, you know, like the dog in my homework type excuses. What kind of excuses are you just tired of hearing about? The one I used to always hear, my secretary did a calendar or something, right? I used to hear that, I'm sitting back and I want to go and strangle the, the, uh, the attorney before the judge does it. What kind of excuses just obviously just don't fly in front of you in your courtroom? I'll start off with where you're going. Hold yourself accountable. Um, you know, whether you have a secretary or an assistant who's doing your calendaring for you, do not ever say, oops, they didn't calendar it for me. This is your client, this is your job, your responsibility. So that one doesn't fly. And if you did miss calendar and you are eating the humble pie, just do it accordingly. Make sure you are making those phone calls as soon as possible if you are late. Um, we all get, everybody has life, those doctor's appointments, those things. Um, but remember if you use the one that my grandmother has died three times now, the same grandmother? <laughs> <laughs> There's a particular lawyer that, that actually utilizes, like, well, didn't she die like two months ago? Uh, so be aware that people do remember those kind of things. Um, be mindful, and if you do make those mistakes or you do need the excuses or, and I say excuses, I mean you need to be excused from a proceeding or something is happening. Again, your reputation will carry a lot of whether that passes the, the scratch on the chalkboard or not. Um, we're much more open to somebody who comes forward and has always appeared, is always punctual, um, has always been prepared and comes in and says, you know what, life happens. Whether you want to divulge your personal issues or not, or if you just want to leave it with, I had a personal issue, a family emergency, my apologies to the court, to counsel, let them know ahead of time. There is no excuse, by the way, not to have professionalism for the counterparts that you work against or with. Um, your co-counsel, your opposing counsel, to let them know I'm not going to be ready for trial or I just am filing this motion to continue late 
there's no reason to walk into a court and not have given that common courtesy. Thank you. The attorney she's referring to with the grandma that died three times, I got a true story for you. He came in and, and at some point during a recess, he started telling me, he's elderly, so time-wise it would have made sense. He said he played for the Green Bay Packers. And he, he put himself on the Packers in the mid to late 60s, and he didn't realize who he was talking to. I said, well, hang on, that would have meant you played in Super Bowl, Super Bowl I. He said, yes, I played in Super Bowl I. And I started peppering him with questions, and I locked him into a whole story, and I really was scratching my head. I knew this. I know this. Right. There's no way this man played for. It's just not. It's not possible. So after the hearing, I went back to Chambers and I googled the roster of the Green Bay. There is a man with the exact same name on that team, except he's African American. <laughs> so uh, in any case, excuses. Uh, you know, you got to remember one thing. Nowadays, with technology, we here in Orange County, I can't speak to LA County. We have notes on the bench, so I can take notes. When you give me a really distinct excuse, I actually write it down, because I'm gonna ask you about it next time, or I'm going to mention it next time, or I'm gonna note that and make sure you don't use it again next time. Uh, so be careful with giving too specific of an excuse if it's not truthful, because I actually write it down and, and I can jog my memory pretty quickly with my own notes. Uh, the miscalendering thing happens a lot. It makes you look really unprofessional, or the, the corollary to you missing a court date because you miscalendered it. The corollary to that is, I gave my client the wrong day. I get that all the time, and that one is nails on a chalkboard for me because I, because the reason is, I told your client face to face what day and what time to be here. So it, it, it would have, it doesn't make sense, it doesn't resonate with me that you then gave him the wrong court date. Uh, or by the same token, I told my client not to be here. I say, well, hang on. I looked at him eye to eye two weeks ago, and I told him to be here at 8.30. So be careful when you uh, instruct your client in a way that's not consistent with, uh, with what I've told him when he appeared in my courtroom. Um, you know, honestly, if, when you walk in the courtroom, I mean, you have a job to divulge only so much information about your client, okay? And, and we all know that, but honesty goes a long way, okay? Because if you're trying to come up, concoct a story, the court's gonna see it. It's just inevitable. Um, I'm, I'm really hard on people about not being ready when we have trial setting conferences and trial data set. I, I am. Um, and, you know, when I hear the words, judge, I'm just not ready, you're going to have a hearing. You have to tell me why you're not ready. And it could be something even like my investigator couldn't get a hold of a witness, it's a key witness, well, it's a hearing then. I need to know how relevant that witness is. So. Know your judge, know your court, know your culture. Um, you know, I, I, I push people in my courtroom, you know, you say you're ready, you're gonna go, because, you know, right now I'm doing dependency, but even before I was doing a felony arraignment counter, in fact, Judge Messer and I swapped places about a year and a half ago. I mean, it's a gigantic calendar that keeps on coming and it doesn't stop. So um, pushing cases over is just really hard on everyone, and I don't think it's fair to the plaintiffs, the respondents, the defendants, whoever the parties are. It's not fair to the society that, we rep that you're representing. And the court, you know, you, Judge Cuellar talked about this earlier, you know, we have to make sure that the community trusts the court system, right? We are the facade, the judges are the facade, and I believe in that. And you know, if you see a judge that's sort of, oh, you know, sure, and defendants or plaintiffs are coming back and to court again and again, they lose trust in their lawyer, they lose trust in the judge, and they lose trust in the system. And it works both ways. So I'm a stickler with, you say you, you know, you're gonna be ready, you better be ready. <laughs> I wish I had judges like that. Sam and Taylor give me money and trial day when we ask for them. All right, we're down to about 10 minutes, folks, and I really don't want this to be the Ada uh, you know, uh, live show. So I want to open this up to the audience. Please take advantage of this. Uh, fire away, please, on questions. Yes, sir. Please introduce yourself so everyone knows who you are, and then fire away. Uh, Mesro of Kudagoyan. Uh, what excuses work in your court? <laughs> I'll advise and judges think the fifth on this one. Hi, Sarah Bagarian. Um, I don't actually have a, a question. <laughs> 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 I 
they're going to answer it. As to the real question, the excuses that work are what Judge Abkari just said. If you have a legitimate reason to continue, or you have a family emergency, or there was an accident on the freeway, those honest representations of the why, as long as they're not repetitive, meaning, you know, I got caught in traffic every single time I come to your yeah. courtroom, um, we're, we're, we're human beings. You know, we want to accommodate. We understand life happens, and we were all trial lawyers, or we were all lawyers at some point before we took the bench. Sometimes you have to remind us, you know, jog those cobwebs, and it's difficult when you are bouncing from courthouse to courthouse. I, I remember that. Um, you, you know, just the honesty. So the excuses, let's not call them excuses, but let's, the reason, the good grounds, the good cause to either be late, to continue, um, to trail, those are, what are your legitimate foundational basis for that? Right. Whatever amounts to real good cause. <laughs> I actually, uh, if, I, I totally agree with what she's saying, so I, I don't want to just repeat it, but I want to let you know that there's two of us who feel the exact same way. Actually, many excuses will work. I think if you're honest, and I can tell that, that you're putting yourself out there and vulnerable, and, and you're just being sort of a straight shooter, uh, I will grant you what I will call professional courtesy. And if you come up and approach, and you tell me, look, I've had a kid who's not doing well, I haven't slept for two straight nights, I'm just not ready for this thing. The DA is objecting to my request for continuance. I'll just turn to the DA and say, Let, let's, let's, give him some, let's extend some professional courtesy, give him a couple of days. He's not asking for two months. Uh, so I think the answer to your question is many excuses worth, but be honest about it. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, but uh, look, if you're a lawyer and they got a real legitimate reason, don't be a, don't be a jerk. I guess I was going to change my other four letter word. You got to accommodate. It's a profession. You know, these are folks you're with. So if there's a legit reason my kid got sick or something, I always accommodate because I hate to be in front of a judge and say, no, I don't care if my kid was sick. Just imagine how that looks. Anyways, ma'am, you had a question, but good question, by the way. Um, what I wanted to comment and acknowledge is that after practicing law for so long, you judges, you have a third eye. It's not just about recognizing the, the fallacies or the, the falsehoods of statements, but you guys get a sense for the case, too, that I am always baffled and amazed. And I wanted to acknowledge that because sometimes it reflects in the orders, and then you create an order, and all of us attorneys are scrambling but then it ends up helping resolve the case in such a beneficial way. I just wanted to acknowledge that in you. And I think you guys know that. There's this third sense or eye that you guys just perceive the attorneys, the case, the parties, and I, I just think that's amazing. And for some reason, you're in that path and in that chair, and, and our, uh, your service to the community is acknowledged. Thank you. What is your name, ma'am? Sarah Madiri. Thank you. Please. Thank you, uh, since the judge pointed out this is the younger side, you guys better start asking some questions, please. Okay. Uh, please, ma'am. Okay, I'm a brand new attorney. Beautiful. But before getting my bar license number, I clerked for a federal judge on the bar. And I remember my judge would always get the list from the state bar for the uh, attorney list that attorneys that just got barred. And recently, he told me that that list is getting longer and longer, and he would never want to see my name on it. So, um, uh, but he had no insight on it. He's like, I don't know why is this happening. He's a former prosecutor. He wasn't been on the defense side so so much. So he's like, I don't know. But you should definitely take this so serious. And uh, you guys should know why is this happening. Ask around. You three judges, great practitioners. Do you have any insight why the list is getting longer and longer? What list? The list of these bar attorneys. This bar. This bar. This bar. Yeah, you. Yeah. I know that judges receive that list mm -hmm. because when I was clerking, I know he would receive well, and. Yeah, this bar attorneys though comes through a separate. It doesn't go through the superior court. No, no, no. It goes through the state court and the uh, state bar and the state, state bar, bar would send uh, a list of these bar attorneys to all the judges, so the judges would know who are the attorneys that whose license was this bar. 
Right. They usually, it's, it's coming through the state bar. They have their own court associated with that. And it's typically for trust account violations. It's mostly like 98% of it is what it is. But if you guys have any answers, like, I don't know if you have experience is, with that. What are the ethical issues that you see and you keep seeing it and you would... For me, this bar? Yeah. Client trust uh, account yeah. issues. That is 98% of it. I, I that. Yes, that yeah, is but, it. <laughs> That's the answer. But maybe there are other ethical concerns. Hopefully, we don't see these these lawyers in front of us. Got it. Okay. Ma'am, you had a, a question, please, Laura. And, and, and introduce yourself so people know who you are. Even though the judge Claire didn't say that you're single and available. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just gonna live with she, that forever. So now. she is the third member of our Bay Area contingency. Laura, come on, please. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you so much for uh, speaking. Uh, my question is, uh, you were all trial lawyers, and um, I'm wondering if you miss being in the advocacy role compared to being in a, in a judicial role, no. and what you sort of I just know you for the salary at the yes, by the way. I knew it you got in your blood. Actually, it's, it's, uh, it's an albatross around your neck as a judge if you still miss the advocacy part of it. I really see uh, the tension in my colleagues that really do miss it, I think they struggle with it more. I think one of the most liberating parts of it, one of the reasons I think I'm actually decent at this is because I have let go of the advocacy of being an advocate. I, I think intellectually, I could have advocated for either, either side. I could have uh, hopefully thrived as a defense attorney. Hopefully I was okay as a prosecutor. It was the art of advocacy at the time. I let that go. I, I, I will tell you that that is not, none of that runs through my blood anymore. And, and I'm also going to comment, I think it was Sarah's comment on the, the that eye, that third eye. It is a very different perspective. It took a transition period for me to let go of the advocacy side because you kind of almost want to say, ooh, are you going to object? Are you, uh, are, are, are you really going to admit that? Um, but I, like Judge Bonsurian, I am so fulfilled by this role, this objective role of being able to listen to both sides. And again, problem solving is something I really enjoy doing. Um, it gives me the best of both worlds. I'm still in a courtroom. I'm still interacting with people. Um, and, and I, too, uh, as much as I, I would say I might miss some of it, not really. This is, this is an amazing job as a judge. Um, it takes a while, okay? It took a while in my case, honestly. It took probably six months to a year to peel myself back from that, um, which is, and, there, and from the very beginning, they put me in a trial calendar, and it was really hard on me. Um, and I think, you know, I did it about a year, and I, was, I did misdemeanor and felony trials, and then I was doing felony arraignments, and, um, it's one of the reasons that I actually chose and asked to be moved out and went to dependency. And I am relieved now that I am no longer in that position because um, once you peel yourself back, I don't know, that's an interesting concept, the third eye, whatever you want to call it, to be able to pull back and just focus on what you think is the right thing. I, I guess you know you're advocating for justice, so it's a different way of advocacy, but it's not necessarily active like lawyers are. So it takes a while, but once you settle in, it's, it's, it's great. <laughs> we'll one more question, folks. One more question. I got that. I'm gonna get that. I'm gonna get that book early soon. So. What do we got? Oh, we got two guys. So if we can make them quick, we'll get two questions sure. there. Please introduce yourself. Yeah. Chris Wojcicki. Court call versus personal appearance. How do you feel about that? Is it something that can be abused? Is it something that um, you invite? Does it make things easier? Does it make things more challenging? First of all, that becomes a cultural issue as well. Um, it obviously happens a lot more in the civil arena than it does. Well, certainly, we don't use it on the criminal side. Uh, and very, very sparingly in, in my juvenile jurisdiction, um, there are some situations where sometimes we want to reach out to a family member or a child who's placed out of county, out of state. Um, for us, the credibility issue is so important to have eyes on that child, on that family member. And certainly when you're in a crim jurisdiction, the jurisdictional purpose of having the defendant there unless there's a waiver on misdemeanors uh, for non-appearance. So it's, it's kind of an apples and oranges situation. 
I think, however, if you have something compelling that you need to say and you want to have that point made in front of that judge, I got to go with it's a much better thing to be there in person because you you really do lose something telephonically on the on the court call. But that's that's my no, yeah, that's absolutely. I concur. <laughs> Sir, I know you had a question. Please introduce yourself and fire away. It's not really a question. It's an interesting anecdote based on what Judge Mansouri had said about taking notes. There was this judge in downtown LA and he would have an early call, 8.15. And he'd be, take the bench probably at 8.15 every time. So one day he, he didn't show up and the clerk announced that he'd be at least half an hour late. So I said, I'm gonna be taking the notes on this in case I'm ever late in the courtroom. This courtroom and ever start laughing. So <laughs> from the other side, <laughs> so. Again, thank you everybody for sticking around. I think it was well worthwhile. Thank you to the panelists, you guys for dynamite. Thank you very much for doing this. Please, uh, panelists, we have a very thank you as well for a uh, wonderful event, uh, program. We have a gift for each of you. Get, get the judges first. I'm not going first. My mother's soul would beat me. Judge Al Qaeda, here you go. It's a book of uh, Armenian treasures at the Alex and Marie Manukian Museum. Uh, art treasures. Uh, Judge Mansuria. I, I want to make one quick comment. I'm going to Armenia for my first time, by the way, in 48 hours. One day I'll be on a flight to Armenia. Thank you. I expected more applause, but I'll take that.